Good evening, everyone. And we're going to start. This is um, this particular, well, I'll, I'll go over to the next. Okay. It's not looking. There we go. So this is a discussion on women in the Sung, Chinese Sung Dynasty. And it's an ongoing series of presentations that I'm doing on women in Buddhism. In fact, I've been doing this for 25 years, but I decided to initiate a new series of presentations. And I'd like to make a point about the specificity of this particular presentation. The last presentation we did was a much more summary overall view of women in Buddhism. And this one is, is much more specific. And while there are a number of sources uh, available about women in Buddhism, much of it is in the academic literature and not in the popular literature. And so as a result, unless you're really digging into it, you're not going to find it. I, I, there are a few, I can count maybe a handful of books that really are in the popular literature about women in Buddhism. Um, but in the, in, the, in the more detailed scholarly literature, there's actually quite a few. Um, there are presentations like the last one that you, does a macro view and others that are more granular, emphasizing a specific point, often with a secondary focus on one personality. And next month, we'll be talking with Ishin, Irene Matsumoto, and her experience directing a Tendai temple in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. And that'll be next month. So we're going back about a thousand years, then we'll go forward. The next, the next week, and please bear with me. Uh, let me move this along. Okay, please bear with me. The following disclaimers that I want to restate re in this slide. And these were mentioned in the previous presentations, but it's a good to restate them each time. The first is that women historically have been discriminated by all the Buddhist schools and women have made significant contributions to Buddhism in spite of the discrimination. But there's always been a place for women in Buddhism. It was often, if not always, more equal than society at large. And I think that that's what, one of the things we have to keep in mind. And again, a stipulation restated is that today we will not be deliberating a critique of Buddhist gender discrimination but we will be discussing women's contributions to and participation in Buddhism. In order to discuss women in the Sung Dynasty, we really have to locate the Sung Dynasty, which was from 960 to 1279. And looking at the, the slide that you see there, you'll see that there were really a northern and a southern Sung. The, the white area is what is today China. And then the brown and the orange were where the Sung Dynasty was located. It's also known as the Song Dynasty. So if you sometimes see it written as Song, other times you'll see it written as Song. It's the same thing. Uh, to better understand the role of women in the Sung Dynasty, we need to put the dynasty into a social, cultural, political context. Chinese dynasties occupy different areas of what we refer to as the political areas of China today. And in this map, you can see the political area of China in the white, and the original Sung occupied both the north and, by comparison to today's China, the middle. And the south but was reduced in size in 1126 when northern tribal armies retook the northern area. So this is referred to as the northern and southern Sung. Considering this was considered a major watershed in Chinese history, to give you an idea, momentous transitions in the structure of Chinese society. Zhao Kunying, the military inspector general, set the nation on a course of sound administration by instituting a competent and pragmatic civil service. He followed Confucianist pr pr principles, lived modestly, took the country's finest military units under his personal command. There was a cultural flowering in literature, art, and thought. In the Sung Dynasty, in particular was noted for its great artistic achievements that it encouraged and in part subsidized. The Beizong dynasty at Bianjing 
had begun a renewal of Buddhism and of literature and the arts. The architecture of the Sung was noted for its tall structures. The highest pagoda at Bianjing was 360 feet or 110 meters tall. And Sung architects carved the eave line of the roof upwards at the corner of pagodas, six or eight sided and built of brick or wood that still survived for that period. The sculpture of the Sung Dynasty period continued to emphasize the representations of the Buddha, and it gave in that genre there were no substantive improvements over the work of the Sung sculptors in succeeding dynasties. So this was really a kind of cultural fluorescent period. There were creations of urban, urban merchant middle classes and trade guilds, which we don't think about as early as, as this period. Increased emphasis on education and the development of civil service examinations. And of course, for those who aren't aware of this, the civil service examinations were taken primarily by the aristocracy because they were the ones who were able to read and, and write and, and study and had the time to do that. The inventions such as the magnetic compass made China a sea power and movable type made books look made books less expensive. So when we think about Gutenberg, just remember that they had movable type in China 500 years earlier, to give you an idea. Um, and that they were, a, they were actually a sea power. I mean, it was in China during this period. Uh, China spread from, um, excuse me, Buddhism spread south to Indonesia and to other places. But under the Sung Dynasty, there was this back and forth from the outlying areas into China and from China into the outlying areas. And while the Silk Road went across the, we think of it as, as that road that goes across Asia, uh, starting in, in, for lack of a better phrase, Venice, um, the southern route was just as, uh, just as vibrant in some cases more so. And there was the creation of manufactured goods and paper currency that permitted the export of these goods that we're just talking about throughout the world. And previous to this, China was primarily an exporter of raw materials and vital resources, and during this period of time became an importer as well as an exporter. So just putting this dynasty, in, and I'm, I'm thinking now about what Maxime had just said to me, we're going to be talking about religion during the Song. And this is much more involved. It was, it was often thought that the Sung Dynasty saw the um, decline of Buddhism in Asia. That's often the way it was presented. But starting in the mid-2000s, uh, research has indicated that there was actually a fluorescence of Buddhism occurring at this time. It was just really based upon the difference in the type of source materials that people have been looking at. Starting in the mid-century with the Sui Dynasty and continuing to the Tang Dynasty, Buddhism flourished, and major trends of Buddhism became part of Chinese culture. And here's what's important. During the Sung, uh, during the Sui Dynasty, which is when you see um, Tiantai Buddhism occurring with Ji Yi, that was really the, the beginning of Tiantai, which later became Tendai Buddhism in Japan. That was really the, flore the not the total fluorescence, but the beginning of Tendai. And then when you go to the Tang Dynasty, you see Hua Yen Buddhism growing uh, much more. Now, Chan Buddhism <coughs> and Pure Land Buddhism, which were the two referred to as the two practice schools, um, they had been developing alongside these two doctrinal schools. Um, but during some of those periods and into the, into the Sung was a period of great unrest. I mean, one of the things about the Sung that allowed it to have this cultural uh, fluorescence was that while there was still an unrest, it wasn't of the same scale as the previous dynasties. And so they could get more done, if you will. And um, so while the three religions of China I would add a fourth, but we'll just say the three religions of China 
which of course are Buddhism and Confucianism and Taoism, we often try to differentiate them one from the other. But in fact, they intertwine to a much greater extent than many people would like them to, or even think that they, that they do. Um, the t there was little conflict between them, and this is important, except at the economic and political levels. So from a philosophical level, there wasn't much different, there was differentiation, but not conflict between Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. But at the economic and political level, that's where the conflict arose, because one uh, individual would favor one over the other, Taoism over Confucianism, etc., one over the other, and that's what brought them into, into conflict, not, not their philosophies and not their practices. They borrowed and, and lent to each other to an amazing extent. And so you see there a picture of the Hangshin Hanging Temple, uh, which was a temple that, a single temple with both Buddhist, Confucian, and Taoist monks at the same time. And Buddhism became popular in China because during the Song Dynasty for three reasons. Because many people were searching for meaning in their lives during this time of political and social upheaval. The teachings of Buddhism were seen as more applicable to everyday life than of Confucianism. And because monasteries and temples were built for the Buddhists, provided a safe place for people to come together and socialize. Hmm, that sounds familiar. And many Buddhist temples and monasteries <coughs> built during this period uh, saw the rise of the Buddhist sects, such as Pure Land and Chan or Zen schools. And Buddhism became increasingly popular among the lower classes which were attracted to its message of equality and equity. However, Buddhism was severely persecuted in 845 and again in the 900s during the Five Dynasties period between the Tang and the Song. And many of the reasons for this oppression were economic. Thousands of temples were destroyed and metal objects melted down for hard currency. And many monks and nuns were forced to return to lay life where they could contribute to the general tax base. Much of this was promulgated by the Confucianists. Um, and, and by the way, just to point out that this is the period of Jikaku, the period that we're talking about. Jikaku was a Tendai monk who went to China and lived there for 10 years and collected an enormous amount of materials and brought it back with him in Japan. And because the temples in China were burned down, they became the only histories of that period of time. And he's, uh, he's a very famous monk uh, in, in Tendai. And so following this persecution, following this persecution, the Confucianism reconciled with Buddhism. Confucianism, Confucianists became familiar with the Buddhist beliefs. There was a morphing of Confucianism and Buddhism <coughs> into a Neo-Confucianism, which I'll add parenthetically, also took place in Japan. We see Neo-Confucianism occurring in Japan uh, at about the same time. And they came to refer to Li, a concept that defined a spiritual presence similar to the universal spirit found in both Hinduism and Buddhism that hadn't existed in Confucianism previously. The point is that there was a resurgence of Buddhism and that set the stage for a greater participation of women. That's why I had to locate this, aside from the fact that it, it gave Craig and Mushin a reason to fall asleep. <laughs> they both woke up and heard that. <laughs> um, so, women in the Sung Dynasty. And let's go over some of the disadvantages that women experienced at that time. And the first is that the rise of Neo Confucianism had also led to a decline in the status of women. In other words, they weren't held in as high esteem as they were in previous periods. There was a public appearance by women was reduced compared to the Tang Dynasty. This is when the practice of foot binding was initiated. And that, I think, says a lot about how women were viewed and foot binding was a way to subjugate 
women in fact. But what are some of the benefits? The first was, and this, these are interesting, given the, the, the uh, things we just talked about in terms of the disadvantages, women also enjoyed new and reinforced property rights. Women could own property. Women couldn't own property in the West for another, how many, 700, 800 years? Give you an idea of, of how momentous, momentous that was. And social mobility and political influence were not completely impossible for women to achieve. They, they held position, so um, political positions, etc. And there are a number of examples of lower class women managing to get considerable power. In other words, what we view as class, while it was certainly there, was reduced quite a bit during this period of time regarding women. The situation for women religious was different. There were several major advancements in relation to Buddhism. Oops. <clears throat> So, something of a summary. The first is that in 972, Emperor Taizu issued an edict that nuns would be ordained only by women and only in convents. This may have been intended to keep the convents pure in that nuns and monks were separated, but the result was that women could do things their own way. They were being told how to do things by the monks. Many traveled to study with famous teachers, and some became independent and powerful teachers in their own right, teaching both men and women. And aristocratic laywomen were major donors to monasteries. And just to fill that out uh, a little bit more regarding uh, only women in convents, the Vinaya at that point still stipulated the, the uh, the Vinaya that was used in China at that point, the Vinaya is the code of discipline, that in order for a woman to be ordained as a nun, then there had to be 10 monks present. That's the reason why to this day in the Theravadan countries, women cannot become nuns because the government insists that the monks cannot attend the nuns' ordinations, so therefore nuns are not ordained you'll find in the Theravada countries where nuns will be, will be living as nuns, but they, they have no official status, put it that way, okay? And so here it is in 970, that didn't really occur until the beginning of the 17th century, uh, the, the fact that it was so arduous for nuns to become, become nuns. I mean, most, most of the monks would have said, sure, you're having an ordination, I'll show up. Are you going to feed me? You know, that you know, stuff. Um, the, what, what was the role of Buddhist women? To par paraphrase Di Hua Sing, the vitality of the Sung is predominantly attributed to men who dominated the Buddhist arena, created new schools of thought, and composed massive bodies of Sung literature. Nevertheless, this period witnessed the increasing participation of women in religious activities as the presence of women gradually becomes reflected in the literary record. It also brought changes to the Sung Buddhist discourse. Both women, uh, excuse me, both Buddhist and Confucian canon demonstrated narrative assumptions about women and their spirituality by making the Mahayana claim that every person, male or female, possessed Buddha mind, a central part of its rhetoric. Chan committed itself to a position from which such negative images of women could be opposed. And Say makes the observation that when examining new evidence of women in the Sung, one must also keep in mind that the images on the roles of women portrayed in the Chan literature reveal more about the men's perception of women than they do about the women's experience as seen from their own point of view. And I think that that's a really an important, an important point. So what we know about what we think we know about the women is coming from a biased source, to put it in another way. It's equally important to recognize that the men who wrote about women in Chan were not simply responding to women's religious needs, they were also using these images of women to 
illuminate Cha'an doctrine to advance the claims of Cha'an vis-a-vis other Buddhist traditions. Female lay patronage played a significant role in maintaining the Cha'an Buddhist monasteries and its activities, as is evidenced in the Sung Cha'an Master's discourse records. And a close examination of Cha'an texts, however, indicates that spiritual achievements, not financial contributions, were the primary criteria for women being given biographical entries or to receive complimentary marks in the Cha'an literature. And one of the more interesting aspects of Cha'an literature is the frequent appearance of lower socioeconomic class women. That's important, very important. A particular fascination is that some of these women may in fact have been mythical and provide an influential way in many monks and nuns' religious experiences. In other words, when we talk about myth in this context, if you want to make a point, you create a myth about the power or the, the uh, abilities or whatever it may be, and that, that's a way of, of um, uh, influencing people's perceptions. The Buddhist nuns, the Kadong Zong, or the Soto Zen School, and that's what became the Soto Zen School in Japan, had its origin in the 8th to 9th century CE, and Ling Zong, or Rinzai Zen School, was started a little later and became prominent in the Sung Dynasty. And it is in this latter school that most of the 13th century, uh, I'm sorry, it's in this latter school that most of the Buddhist nuns were recorded. I take much of this portrait from Miriam Levering's estimate that approximately 13% of the monastic communities in the early decades of the 13th century were nuns, so about 13%. There are many nuns who are well known from this period of time, and you'll see their names there, and we have biographies and hagiographies. So it's not that we don't know about these people. We do. My question is, why aren't people talking about them? It's not, it's not that we don't know about them. It's that why are people not talking about them? And the first record of an awakened teacher and lineage no, no, member first recorded, recorded evidence of a awakened teacher, not male, not female teacher, and lineage member is Moshan Li Ran. She became an abbot and is associated with many of the interesting stories. She is the first woman recorded as the primary teacher of a male student. One interesting story about Moshan Liran was that a young monk, Ji Xuan, who came to her looking for the Dharma, one of the tests, one of the tests was to ask, what is the summit mountain? That being a translation of Moshan. Moshan is Summit Mountain. And the dialogue follows. You can't see its creek. It's hidden by the clouds, she answered. What is the hermit who lives there? What are they like? asked Chi Chuan. Neither man nor woman, without appearance, she answered. Transform yourself, he shouted. Liron looked at him. <laughs> Why should I change? <laughs> what would you have me become? <clears throat> Chi Xian gave up and became a gardener at the temple. <laughs> <laughs> the second teacher and lineage member was Mi Tuao, Mi Tuao, whose biography is the most complete uh, for a particular. Oops, it didn't go. There we go. Whose biography is the most complete for a particular reason. The second Sung Buddhist nun to be re recognized as a Chan teacher and a full lineage member. We find a complete record of her and her Chiatai universal record. As such, there's a very complete record of her background, training, awakening, stories, and teachings. And again, I refer you to Miriam Levering. She studied one of the most renowned Lin Chi masters. Remember, that's Rinzai. Tahwei. He introduced the practice of inspecting the critical phrase of a koan story and was extremely critical of Kao Duan Zong. According to Levering, this relationship was extremely important because the, this Chan master was willing to welcome 
Miyatai into his inner circle of serious students and give her the same kind of instruction he was giving monks, including oral interviews along with Dharma instruction. And this act had important consequences for him. Indeed, her success in reaching a moment of awakening using this method was the first success as a teacher and played a large role in setting the pattern for his subsequent teaching and for Lin Ji in general. So she was seminal to Lin Chi's development in China, and then we could argue to Rinzai's development in Japan. The following, uh, following her awakening, Mia Dao embarked on a career as an abbess and Chan teacher, and she taught many women at her monastery. One of her accomplishments was to convince men still caught in an androcentric view of the world that the power of awakening and the nature of universal potential was such that women could awaken and teach Cha'an. If they were willing to accept the teaching, perhaps they were even more fully awakened. In conclusion, it's important to study Buddhists who were women because they contributed historically and still contribute to what we think of as Buddhism. Often this role has been recorded or is it has, has, has not been recorded or recorded to a lesser extent than that of men. And that's because their contributions, that is not because their contributions were not as great, but because of the social, social mores of that given time. Buddhist follows those mores in order to be a functioning element of society. In other words, Buddhism is a human enterprise and in order to find success, it has to follow the social mores of a particular period. Uh, I think back to um, the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, just about women specifically, in which women were claimed to be equal, but after his death, the Vinaya changed things around following the social mores of India at that time, which put women into a, a lesser position. In the current social environment, we have an opportunity, in fact, an obligation to investigate and let the true nature of women's influence be known, not merely to seek equity, but to learn from the wisdom women have contributed. Many people, women and men alike, are engaged in revealing the true nature of the Buddhist teachings by telling the stories of these courageous women, and at the same time, disseminating their teachings. And this is an ongoing series. Next month we'll be joined, as I said earlier, by Reverend Ishin Irene Matsumoto, head priest of Palo Akanan Temple in Honolulu, Hawaii, for many decades. She's now in her early 90s and has agreed to talk with us and be interviewed on the journey her temple's been on in the early years, being a Japanese Buddhist temple during the Pacific War and into the 21st century. And just as important, she speaks as a woman who has spread the Dharma in a fascinating and unique fashion. And for those who are so interested, these are some, but not all, the sources that I used. So, of special interest is, is Buddhism in the Sung Dynasty. Um, obviously, that, that and it's interesting, there are two chapters devoted specifically to women out of, I'm guessing it's about a dozen chapters, but in addition to those two chapters devoted exclusively to, to women, there are another four chapters that bring women's contributions into the picture um, at that time. Can I go forward or are still taking down? Okay. And so, now we come to questions and comments. Thank you so much. And first, I would like to um, offer Ichishima Sensei, do you have any reflections or comments about women in the Sung Dynasty? I don't think that that's really one of your more <laughs> uh, active research interests, but I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on it. Well, thank you. Well, the, it's interesting that uh, uh, you, you were also the uh, Wagesa, a rup kesa. Uh, this was invented by Jikaku Daishi uh, Enin, uh, who went 
to, to China at the time of persecution of China around uh, 845 around. And uh, the Buddhist really uh, persecuted and therefore he uh, invented to wear this kind of loop kesa instead of a uh, rope. So that is interesting. And another point is uh, Japanese uh, tea ceremony really uh, introduced by the Eisai, uh, who was very active. Then uh, and Tendai, esoteric Buddhist priest at the time, at the same time, he uh, was uh, uh, Japanese uh, Rinzai Zen's uh, master. So these two points I just uh, came up in my mind. And I, I can tell more about uh, women's in China, but you, you mentioned the uh, Reverend Matsumoto in Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, she's a really uh, intellectual lady. And uh, I knew her a long, long time. And uh, her husband, Richard Matsumoto, worked with us uh, translating Kentai folklore teachings at the University of Hawaii at more, maybe almost uh, 50 years ago. And so unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, her wife, uh, you know, Reverend uh, Matsumoto, still working over 90 years of age. I really appreciate her. That is just uh, my comment so far. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei.